I live in Los Angeles and I'm always hearing people talk trash about LA and it seems to be an acceptable thing to do. Try talking trash about any other city in the world and that city will have a whole bunch of defenders. Like, how dare you speak of Chicago, New York, San Francisco, Atlanta, Boston, Austin, St. Louis, Portland, etc. in that fashion, but no one ever speaks up and defends LA, ever. Why is that? Everyone says that LA is unlivable because rent is too high, the cost of living is out of control, the crime, the homelessness, the traffic, but those are all problems that plague every single major city everywhere. But I get it, LA has a bad rap for having a bunch of fake folks looking for fame and fortune, nothing like in those other major cities. New York doesn't have these hipster phonies and neither does Austin. The LA I see depicted on TV and in movies is a very foreign image of the LA that I have never experienced. And it's kind of weird. I was born here. I grew up here. I too went to film school and had higher aspirations than being just a, what is this? Oh yeah, a cam girl. No, actually they make really good money and I'd be lucky if I had that kind of income. <laughs> Anyways, that's not the point of this. I'm not gonna defend the newer, fancier, rich, trendier part of LA. Oh no. Today we're gonna talk about the old part of LA, the hood part of LA, East LA. I got my 40 here and I'm prepared and ready to talk about East LA. As you may or may not know, the city of Los Angeles started with a small street known as Alvarez Street. It's the oldest part of what we know as Los Angeles. When it was settled by the Spanish, Los Angeles was then called El Pueblo de Nuestra Señora de Los Angeles. And I say settled because the people whose lands we stand on were the Tongva and Chumash people. The Tongva called this area Ya Nang. Normally, when referring to the East Los Angeles area, folks are referring to three neighborhoods in particular. Boyle Heights, El Sereno, and Lincoln Heights. These are the oldest neighborhoods in Los Angeles. I'm also including the cities that are next to these, often called the Gateway Region of Los Angeles. These gateway cities include Bell, Huntington Park, Vernon, Maywood, Commerce, Bell Gardens, and so many other cities. I live in one of these gateway cities, and we too are east of Los Angeles, along with what is East Los Angeles. We are also considered part of the ghetto, part of the scary part of LA. Plus, the oldest house in LA County is the Gage Mansion in Bell Gardens. So this all counts. Some notable places on this side of Los Angeles are La Plaza del Mariachi, El Mercadito, the Sears Building, King Taco, the East LA Interchange, Cesar Chavez Boulevard, Whittier Boulevard, and the LAC USC Medical Center. While writing and planning this video, I had intended to go and show you all of these iconic places, but since we're in the middle of this coronavirus pandemic and we're in quarantine, I can't exactly go out to these places and show them to you. Even though by the time this video goes up, the quarantine will have been over for the most part, but I don't wanna risk it. I'll probably go and show you these places in future videos, but for now, we're just gonna do the pictures up on the screen. Anywho, these places are super iconic and represent East Los Angeles in all its incarnations, the past, the present, and a little bit of the future. Here are the mini histories of all these landmarks of note. La Plaza del Mariachi is located in Boyle Heights, and as the name tells you, musicians specializing in mariachi music gather here. They wait to get hired for various jobs and parties, restaurants, and other performances. La Plaza del Mariachi has been around since the 1930s. Today it consists of a statue of Mexican singer and actress Lucha Reyes, a kiosk donated by the birthplace of mariachi music, Jalisco, Mexico, and an affordable living complex. This living complex was a hotel, but after battling gentrification, it was made into affordable apartments. More on gentrification later. 
El Mercado de Los Angeles, aka El Mercadito, was built in 1968 and is also located in Boyle Heights. El Mercadito is a three-story shopping center with almost anything and everything you want for your Mexican and Central American needs. You could find it all there, including a place where you can send your family back in the old country some money and a travel agency that specializes in making travel to Mexico and Central America a whole lot easier. King Taco. Back in 1974, a true culinary genius, Raul Martinez, started his taco empire in a converted ice cream truck. Dude invented the modern food truck. After opening his first restaurant in Cypress Park, Martinez opened the flagship restaurant on 3rd Street in East LA. Best horchata and wet burritos ever. <laughs> The Sears Roebuck and Company Mail Order Building. Located on the corner of Soto and Olympic Boulevard, this historic landmark was built in 1926. Up until 1992, this was the Sears Mail Order and Distribution Center for this side of the country. Today, it is a working retail store. We have been shopping here for decades, and I'm glad it hasn't been torn down and made into luxury apartments. And from the freeway, you can see the iconic ears sign. That S in Sears hasn't worked for a very, very long time. Speaking of the freeway, the East Los Angeles Interchange. This is the busiest freeway interchange in the world. Here you can take the I-5, the I-10, the 101, or the 60, and these connect you to the rest of the state, the rest of the country, and yes, the rest of the world. One of the earliest engineering marvels back when it was built in the 1960s, it's estimated that over 550,000 vehicles pass through this interchange every single day. This interchange is officially called the Eugene A. Obregón Memorial Interchange, named after a Marine and a Medal of Honor recipient, Eugene A. Obregón, a Los Angeles native. Other names for this interchange are the Beast, the East Delay, the Malfunction Junction, and the Nickel and Dime. Whittier Boulevard, up until 1920, was called Stevenson Avenue. In East LA, this is one of the most iconic streets in Los Angeles. So many cultural events have happened and continue to happen on this street. Back in World War II, it was the Zoot Suit Riots. Low riding culture started right here after World War II and continues to this day. The Latino Walk of Fame, which I'm just learning about, <laughs> has plaques recognizing notable Latinx folks from the community. And nowadays, Whittier Boulevard is where all the hotspot food places are. Cesar Chavez Avenue. In 1994, Brooklyn Avenue was renamed Cesar Chavez Avenue in honor of the union leader and working class Latin icon Cesar Chavez. If you look closely, you'll see both Cesar Chavez Avenue and Brooklyn street signs up and down the stretch of road. Los Angeles was careful to honor its present Latinx population and its past Jewish community. So both signs are up honoring Los Angeles's past and present. People who have lived in this area for decades still call that street La Brooklyn. As a kid, I was always confused why my mom would call it La Brooklyn, but now I know. To the west, this street turns into Sunset Boulevard, and to the east, it turns into Riggins Street. <laughs> The LAC USC Medical Center. One of the busiest hospitals in the country, the LAC USC Medical Center opened in 1878 with only 100 beds to serve the city of Los Angeles. This hospital was built by Los Angeles County, the LAC part, and they partnered with the newly opened University of Southern California, the USC part. The medical center is a teaching hospital and specializes in serving one of the most underserved communities in the country. I've come up here a couple of times to the emergency room. Hashtag janky body disease. And I'm still waiting to get an MRI for my janky kidney. Again, hashtag janky body disease. Kudos to them for being able to serve millions of people each year and still being in good spirits when you visit, or at least when I've come here. Fun facts, Marilyn Monroe was born here. The Art Deco style of the old building makes it perfect for movies and TV shows. You've seen it in the CBS drama Cold Black, the ABC soap opera General Hospital and in Terminator, the Sarah Connor Chronicles. 
East Los Angeles and the Gateway Cities have the highest percentage of Latinx people at 96%. Mostly here you'll find first generation immigrants, second generation children of those immigrants, third and beyond, generation of grandkids, great grandkids, etc. And as you can imagine, with those demographics, there are no millionaires here. Everyone on this side of LA is working class. Seems appropriate. This is the oldest part of Los Angeles. The part that built the rest of Los Angeles is home to the part that keeps it running. It seems cliche at this point to point out and remind everyone that immigrants, we get the job done. Of course, we do most of the restaurant, service, construction, childcare, elderly care, factory work, and so on. We have a different relationship to work than most do. For immigrants and children of immigrants, you're lucky to have a job, period. A lot of people who emigrated here immigrated here with nothing, with only the clothes on their backs. And here with a minimum wage job, they can afford to have a place to live in and some money to send back to their family in the old country. A job is a job. And if you want to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, there is no such thing as a job that's beneath you. That's why it's common in our community for folks to have two or three three jobs or go to college while working a job or two. Should one job be enough for everybody? Absolutely. But that's not the reality we live in. So you do what you have to do to survive. And of course, the notion that immigrants get here and are on welfare is not just false. You can't get government assistance without legal documentation. It's dumb too. For almost all immigrants, immigrant children and immigrant grandchildren, we do not want a handout. That's kind of insulting. We just want an opportunity. That's that's why there's so much traffic on this side of town at all times. On the other side of town, during vacations and holidays, it's a ghost town. Right now during the quarantine, there's almost no one outside on that side of town. Over here on this side, there's no such thing as an off time or an off season. It's not because we're disobeying orders from Governor Hotness. It's because folks working those factory, food, delivery, grocery store, etc. jobs keep the city and its citizens going with the things they need to survive during during this crisis. Remember, immigrants, we get the job done. I actually took this course in college, so let's see what I remember. When I first signed up for this class in college, I was skeptical. I'm sure when folks hear the term environmental racism, they must think damn liberal snowflakes. They call everyone racist. Even the environment is racist. Dumb liberals. But hang with me here. A lot of this stuff is pretty dang shocking, especially if you live in or around the hood like I do. Environmental racism as defined by the commissioner of racial justice, Benjamin Chavez, is racial discrimination in environmental policy, deliberate targeting of communities of color for toxic waste facilities, and the history of excluding people of color from leadership of the ecological movement. The father of environmental justice, Professor Robert Bullard, defines it as any policy practices or directive that differently affects or disadvantages, whether intended or unintended, individuals, groups, or communities based on race or color. It boils down to this. It's pollution by corporations or the government of the air, ground, or water almost exclusively in and around neighborhoods of low-income people of color without regard for or invitation to these people to become involved and have have a say in what is happening in their neighborhoods. The most high profile example of this is the Dakota Access Pipeline. Originally, since it was more direct to put that pipeline through an affluent white neighborhood, that's where it was going to go. But since affluent white people are allowed the luxury of being involved in these decisions, it was decided that the pipeline would go through the Native American land next to a river they need for their survival. Capitalism, why is this still a thing? And a lot of folks are guilty of this. This. For example, everyone's favorite millennial boomer, Bernie Sanders, co-sponsored a bill that would have dumped nuclear waste from Vermont to a low-income, mostly Latino community in Texas. Yikes. So much for ideological purity, but I digress. I live near a ton of factories. Most of them are food related. One that was truck related exploded just a couple of blocks from my house. There are two factories in particular that I would like to highlight, both in Vernon, the Farmer John factory and the Exide battery recycling factory. Let's start with Exide. The Exide factory closed down almost five years ago. Before that, this battery recycling plant was pumping lead, arsenic, and 
and other toxic metals into the air for over 30 years. The cities most affected are East Los Angeles, Boyle Heights, Commerce, Maywood, Bell, and Huntington Park. The state has cleaned up some of the pollution, but of course, not nearly enough. I think after this administration, Manos Estomago got into the White House, the state government has been preoccupied with stopping and fighting whatever crap this administration has decided to do. So fine, but we still need this area to be cleaned and not just shrugged off with, it's been a couple of decades, what's a couple of more decades? And I know this area is ignored because we're just a bunch of illegals and people from shithole countries. Official government language, not mine. It's not just that we're affected by this. As I mentioned earlier, there are a bunch of food factories, plants, and storages here. So if you've eaten something that has passed through here and the places that store a lot of your bougie food, congratulations, you've eaten lead and arsenic too. The other factory here that's a huge problem is the Farmer John factory. The only activism and protesting I could find in relation to this factory is for the mistreatment of animals. And I'm not gonna be heartless and say that that's not an important cause because it is. Don't mistreat or abuse animals. What gets almost no attention is the stench of death we have to deal with. At night, this entire area of LA stinks. It stinks really horribly, terribly bad, like death. And that's because Farmer John and other food factories dump a lot of the waste into the Los Angeles River. That river passes right smack in the middle of this area. And since it's the Los Angeles River, it flows all the way down. The stench of death is concentrated here in the hood, but the pollution extends far beyond here. And this was a point I touched briefly on in the last video. Activism for other things like animals gets a lot of attention and action, yet there's no activism for us. Again, in the words of the federal government, we're a bunch of people from a bunch of shithole countries. Thanks for all the pollution. Wouldn't it be ironic if all this pollution made our immune systems better and stronger to fight things like this coronavirus? <laughs> Now on to the most dangerous pollutant of all, gentrification. No conversation about the hood is complete without talking about the most dangerous plague there is, and that plague is gentrification. I'm not gonna go through the history or dive too deeply into why it's not a good thing, because it's not, but more on that in a bit. Before we get into that, I wanna make a comparison. This is a bit hyperbolic, but whatever. Modern day gentrification is modern day colonialism with a twist. Let's start off with that twist. This area of Los Angeles has always been and will continue to be working class. Thanks to racist, unjust things like redlining, these places have been undesirable places to live. So all the folks they wanted out of the fancier parts of LA were pushed to these parts. This working class area used to be home to working class white people at one point. On the block where I live now, there used to be a lot of older white folks living here. And to be fair, they never seemed to be too concerned with the scary hood part of LA that you see on the news. But a lot of other folks, as soon as they saw some brown people move in they fled to other parts of LA or California or the nation. Now, there are quite a few white folks looking to gentrify this area. It was interesting while I was researching gentrification and this area, the thing that kept popping up was real estate listings and tips on how to get cheaper housing in Los Angeles. This is where the modern day colonialism thing comes in. These folks see cheaper prices of houses and businesses, move in, make everything more expensive, housing being the main thing, and push out all the folks who built these neighborhoods. Then more of these white folks move in because all of a sudden it's desirable. Why is it expensive and desirable all of a sudden? It's because some white folks decided it was. While we were here, it's scary, cheap, and worthless. When they move in, they get to decide that it's trendy, expensive, and exclusive. Very colonial. Hundreds of years ago, when the original colonizers came to the new world, they were like, this place is okay, but you know what would make it better? If we kick all those folks off their land and declared we found this amazing place and let's pretend like we're doing a good thing and giving this land value because we're here now. Sound familiar? The best thing to happen lately to this area is the total complete rejection of gentrification. The people here did not let real estate jackals turn that hotel in Mariachi Plaza into luxury apartments or the historic Sears building into luxury apartments. People here have kicked out folks trying 
trying to make white art galleries happen. Our boutique expensive as hell coffee shops happen. They're not gonna happen. And I know this video might seem to most people like I'm pupping up this area and inviting gentrification to happen. I am not doing that. This is not happening. I just want people to have respect for this area and the people who live here. This part of LA, being the oldest part, the part that is home to the vast majority of the working class people who keep the city running, the part that is treated poorly, the part that these people who live here deserve more reverence. And if you're a rich person looking to move here and gentrify this place, ignore everything I've said. It's super scary here and you will be killed in a drive-by shooting. Ghetto birds. <laughs>